This is the word of God. Let us give our attention unto it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. Once again, seek the Lord's face in prayer as we ask his blessing on his word. Father, we confess ourselves this morning to be utterly dependent upon you. From you, O Lord, we need and look to receive all things. And this morning we seek instruction by your holy word. We confess our innate ignorance and our darkness, the darkness that dwells in our hearts and minds by nature. But your word is light. Pray that you would dispel the darkness in our minds. Your word is truth. May you correct, O Lord, and dispel the lies and falsehood that we cling to in our hearts. And your word, O Lord, alone is the path of life. So may may you set our feet in the way that we may walk according to it. Bless us, O Lord, as we receive this word. May we receive it from your hand, even from Christ himself. And may it be to us as you have promised and as we hope a means of grace. Well, we're all familiar with Psalm 1. Maybe many of you have memorized it. Certainly, at least you've memorized the opening two verses. But it's clear from this psalm that the Lord has pronounced that man and that man alone to be blessed, whose godliness can be seen, seen in his character, in his attitude to God's law, in his life, and then as the psalm ends, in his end. But as we know from the rest of Scripture, this godliness that the psalmist commends and that the psalmist says is makes a man blessed, we know that this godliness isn't something that we generate of ourselves. Paul says, by the works of the law, no one will be justified in God's sight. And Solomon himself said that there's not a righteous man on earth who never sins. Instead, we know again from Scripture that this godliness of which the psalm speaks is a gift. And it's the work of God himself in the heart and life of every poor sinner who has thrown himself at the feet of Jesus in a cry for grace and undeserved mercy. And as we'll learn, Lord willing, from 1 Peter next week, the godliness godliness of which this psalm speaks is the spirit-wrought fruit of God's saving grace in a person's heart. It's the mark of a man who has been the undeserved recipient of the sovereign electing and redeeming grace of God. It's the evidence, in fact, of the indwelling of that spirit who works in a child of God, as Paul says, to will and to do according to God's good pleasure. And once we understand that, that godliness is not of our own making, but a gift from God and even the work of the spirit within us, once we understand that, then we can speak as this psalmist does of a man as a godly man and not feel like that we're going to rob God of his glory or that we're going to give man the credit for his godliness. Because a godly man, if he is godly, he is so by God's grace alone. And God gets himself glory by making men godly. I want to look at verse 1 this morning. Verse 1 tells us an awful lot about the ungodly man. But its purpose is actually to describe the godly man. But it doesn't do it in the way we might expect. Look at the verse again. We would expect the opening verse to say something like, Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the godly, who stands in the way of the righteous, who sits in the seat of the humble. After all, isn't that how the Pharisee saw things in Luke 18 when he said, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. 
he counted his godliness to be summed up in what he did. And don't we often think of godliness in terms of what we do? We think of a show of godliness and the greatest show of godliness in what a man does. And we have boxes that we check, things that we're supposed to do. And doing them, we count ourselves godly, we count another man godly. But here the Psalter begins by summing up a man's godliness in what he refuses to do. And the reason is because a great part of godliness is actually in what a person does not do. In fact, Adam's whole godliness in the Garden of Eden, in the covenant of works, Adam's whole godliness consisted in what he was not to do. The Lord made a covenant with Adam and said, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. And if Adam had not eaten of that tree, he would have been a perfect man who never sinned. And besides that, just to recollect in your own minds, if eight out of the ten commandments are given to us as negatives, then surely a great part of godliness consists in a man's negative holiness. That is, in a man's refusals. Because just as oil will not mix with water, and a light cannot abide with darkness, so piety refuses to live with ungodliness. So what are a man's, a godly man's refusals? The psalmist says there's three. First of all, a godly man, he says, is blessed because he refuses to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Let's unpack this just a little bit. What is a walk? He refuses to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, a man's walk is the course of his life. It's the tenor of his ways. It's that by which he distinguishes himself, and therefore it is that by which others identify him. For example, we describe a person as sympathetic because in every possible situation in which any measure of suffering or loss has fallen upon someone or something, this person's sympathy and compassion are naturally drawn out. It's the way we say of that person, he's a very sympathetic person. We describe another man maybe <coughs> as angry or discontent because every little thing that crosses his will draws out complaints and scowls. That's a man's walk. It's the course of his life. It's the tenor of his ways. It, it gives way to a general description overall of what this man really is, what this person is like. How about counsel? What is counsel? Well, counsel refers to the persuasions and the convictions and the principles by which a person walks. Now, none of us walks without counsel of some kind. And so by itself, counsel is a thing to be praised. Counsel is a thing to be sought. In fact, as you well know, Proverbs tells us that wisdom is found in the presence of many counselors. Now, Isaiah 9, 6 encourages the church of Christ by promising the coming of one who would be her wonderful counselor. As Proverbs makes clear then, it's the fool who refuses counsel. It's the fool who goes his own way as if all knowledge stopped with him. So that the problem isn't walking according to counsel. The problem is walking according to counsel that's ungodly. The godly man will walk because he won't be idle. The godly man will seek and follow counsel because he won't be self-conceited and think that he knows it all. But the godly man's walking and the godly man's counsel will have nothing to do with the ungodly. Because ungodliness is the spice that poisons the broth. Once you add ungodliness to either your walk or your counsel, you overthrow all thinking. You overthrow all, law all lawfulness, all blessing. And you have yourself to thank if others account you to be ungodly. And so the point of this first statement is that like Enoch, all the godly walk with God and they don't make ungodly men their counselors. Part of the problem, of course, of the counsel of the ungodly is that it's everywhere, isn't it? It's everywhere. The godly man doesn't send to the ungodly for advice any more than Eve sent to the devil for his. And yet at every turn... The ungodly are always there, always ready to counsel us, always ready to draw us back from a godly life, from advertising to magazines to media to entertainment. 
we're being drowned by the counsel of the ungodly on how to think, how to speak, how to dress, how to live. We're being counseled on what to value, what to treasure, what to protect. We're being, we're being counseled on one's rights as well as one's obligations. We're being counseled on what to shun, what to avoid, what to ignore. And if we're not aware that that's happening and stand guard against it, we will be led astray by ungodly counsel. We'll think we're doing fine because we're not walking in the ways of open sin. But because we're listening to the counsel of the ungodly and because we're imbibing the principles by which the ungodly live and we're being directed by the examples and the ideas of the ungodly, termites are all the while eating away at our spiritual strength. And before we know what has happened, our will to do good is weakened our conscience is desensitized to sin. Our former resolutions to do right are all forgotten. And we're just one temptation away from sitting in the seat of the scoffer. And so the blessing of the Lord and the happiness of a life lived for God's glory is known by that man, says the psalmist, who refuses to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. But there's a second refusal here for which the godly man is said to be blessed. And that is because he refuses to stand in the way of sinners. And here we see that just as the ungodly have their walk, so sinners have their stance. And since both are poisoned by wickedness, the godly man refuses both. And furthermore, just as the ungodly have their counsel by which they walk, so sinners have their way in which they stand. It's a well-trodden path. It's beaten down and made easy, says Matthew 7, by their constant travel in the ways of sin. But this seems like an unnecessary refusal to some. We might ask, and we might be asked, but we might ask our own, our own selves, what harm can be done? What harm can come by just standing in the sinner's way? We're not doing anything after all. We're just standing there. What hurt ever came to a bystander looking on? And doesn't the Lord say in Matthew 7, 13 that, that this way is actually a really wide way? And therefore, may not sinners traveling in the way of sin pass by a bystander and just let us be? Notice what else the Lord says in Matthew 7, 13. He says it's a wide way, but he also says those who enter into it are many. What happens when a man tries to stand still in a way that's not only crowded, but in which everyone is pressing and running hard in the same direction? What happens to that man? What happens to a man who tries to stand still in the middle of a mob, pressing in one direction? Well, you know what happens. He'll be shouldered and shoved forward in spite of himself. And he will eventually come to the same destruction as everyone else who has trod that way. You see, this wide way of sin, this wide way in which sinners stand and walk and run, it's not like the way of the righteous where a man can stand for a long time before he meets with a fellow pilgrim who will urge him forward. When a man stands in the way of sinners... He can't help but going as the crowd goes and doing as the crowd does and ending up as the crowd ends up. He's just going with the flow. It's like throwing a limb or even a great big log into a fast moving river. It can't help but be moved and projected forward. It's foolish for a man who stands in the way of sinners to expect anything different than to be pushed along in that way. If he wants a different outcome, he needs to assume a different stance in a different way, a different path, that is. And so you see, this is anything but an unnecessary refusal. To stand in the way of sinners is to herd with evildoers. It's to approve and, and frame one's life after their counsels and their example. And the psalmist says it's this that the godly man refuses. Because as Christ makes clear in Matthew 7, 
He has no business in that way. Neither walking nor standing. It's a path of transgression. But there's a third and final refusal in this verse for which a godly man is blessed. It's because he refuses to sit in the seat of scoffers. What is a scoffer? Well, a scoffer is anyone who despises the things of God and calls Christianity a crutch for the weak or a fool's religion. The scoffer is one who is right in his own eyes and thinks himself wiser than God. In Mark 15, 31 to 32, we read that it was scoffers who mocked Jesus on the cross. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. And it was scoffers who in 2 Peter 3 followed their own sinful desires and denied the second coming of Christ, accusing God of lying. Things have been and things always will be the same. Where is this coming? Those who sit in the seat of scoffers have their hearts hardened in the ways of sin so that what began in their life as ungodly principles gave way to sinful habits and has now settled into proud rebellion. We read of this man sitting in the seat of scoffers. He, he sits like a hen on his sinful desires, he takes pride when they're brought forth for all to see. What he was once before ashamed of doing, he now glories in. And what he was at one time glad to do standing, he is now proud to do sitting. It's difficult to miss the gradation here. It's obvious to us, isn't it? The gradation in the progress of sin. Walking, standing, sitting. What may begin as an error soon becomes obstinacy and then finally defiance. If we think of the walkers as beginners in sin and the standers as proficients in sin, then what are the sitters? but graduates and doctors of sin. If walking is a tasting of sin, a standing of feeding on sin, then sitting must be a cooking up of sin. It's without question then that all three things are refused by the godly man because all three of these are rocks that will shipwreck a man's faith. So according to this verse, these are the godly man's refusals. This is his negative holiness. This is that side of his piety which he chooses by rejection. Now some of us might be wondering why neither of these three reflects a specific commandment. In other words, why doesn't the verse say something like, Blessed is the man who walks not according to the counsel of liars, nor stands in the way of murderers, nor sits in the seat of adulterers. Or why doesn't it say something like, who walks not according to the counsel of blasphemers, nor stands in the way of idolaters, nor sits in the seat of Sabbath breakers? And for that reason, some have read this and thought of it as too legalistic, this verse. But the reason why it's not worded in that way, and instead in the way that it is worded, is because while the commandments themselves are the marks and duties at which we aim, these refusals are the means by which we aim. And we hit those marks. You see, the man who walks in the counsel of the ungodly will become a liar. The man who stands in the way of sinners will become a murderer. And the man who sits in the seat of scoffers will himself become an idolater and an adulterer. And so anyone who says that he aims at obeying God's commandments, but doesn't refuse the counsel, the way, and the seat of the ungodly, will only miss the mark but he will also find himself in the company of the cursed, short of the prevenient and intervening grace of God. These are the godly man's refusals. Well, how do we apply this verse? What do we do about this? Well, it's obvious, I think. 
The psalmist teaches us here, first of all, that it's impossible for any man to be blessed by God who hasn't first separated himself from the company of the ungodly. And we need to think about that. And we need to take that to heart. Living in a world that is by nature ungodly. Living, as we've seen from 1 Peter, as strangers in this world. We must separate ourselves from the ungodly. It has been true, and it always will be true, that if men would be saved, they must forsake bad company. William Plumer said this, He who goes with a multitude to do evil shall go with a multitude to suffer punishment. And he who persistently walks and stands and sits with the ungodly shall lie down with them in hopeless sorrow. It's unavoidable. These are the things and the ways that the godly man refuses because you can't be godly and adhere to these ways. You can't have it both ways. You can't serve God and mammon, says the Lord Jesus Christ. You love the one, you hate the other. It can't be both. This is why Christ says of the world in Revelation 18.4, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. If you take part in her sins, you will share in her plagues. You can't have her sins and not the plagues that follow. You must come out, says the Lord Jesus. And so if there's a loud and clear lesson in this opening verse, it's that we must not make the wicked our companions or our counselors. So of course, we rub shoulders with the world. Paul says, I never told you to go out of the world. We need to be a light in the world. But the world can't be our companions in this bosom sense. And the world can't be our counselors in any sense. Let me give you five reasons why it's so important that we heed this lesson. First of all, because sin, to which the world urges us, and all three of these ways give way to sin and are marked by sin. First of all, because sin is dangerously infectious. Why do you think the Bible compares sin to leprosy, to leaven, and to poison? Why do you think the Bible compares sin to a sickness or an uncleanness that pollutes the whole body? Because it's infectious and it pollutes the whole person. How different would your daily experiences be if you treated sin like you treat a deadly poison or a deadly virus? Secondly, we need to heed this counsel because we're all prone to sin. A Christian, of course, is a new creature in Christ. A Christian has a new nature that delights in obedience to God. But Paul says, until we lay this body in the grave, sin still dwells within us. Sin in me, says Paul. We still possess a natural born inclination to sin. An inclination against which, the apostle says, we need to fight every single day. I beat my own breast, says the apostle. And we're not without hope here, of course, because the Lord promises that the more we fight against it, the weaker it gets. And the stronger, the new man, if you will, becomes. But think of it this way, just as an analogy that's helpful in my mind. We may have been taken up as a barren and dead limb from the forest and made into a beautiful spindle on the lathe of grace and now find ourselves as part of the body of Christ. What a transformation. But after all that, we're still flammable. Get us close enough to the flames of sin and temptation and short of intervening grace, like Peter and like David, we will catch fire. And the world is fraught with the, fr- with the flames of corruption and sin. There are snares at every turn which play on the sin within us, enticing us with those baits to which our sinful nature is attracted. And so the first step in a godly life is to renounce the company of the ungodly. Because it not only multiplies our temptations by putting us in harm's way, but because it's too near the flames of temptation. Christians are not like the fish who can swim in salt water and still taste fresh. Swimming in an ocean of sin will contaminate us. Which is why Calvin said, the servants of God must endeavor utterly to abhor the life of ungodly men. 
And thirdly, this is a necessary lesson with which to begin the Psalter because to the eyes of sense, the life of the wicked looks like anything but a cursed life. And the life of the godly, who deny themselves what the world touts as pleasurable and worthwhile and fun, looks very hard and restrictive and burdensome. In fact, it's, it's the ones who have completely abandoned the law of God and gratify their lust that appear to be having all the fun because they're enjoying their heart's desires. As you know, Asaph struggled with this in Psalm 73 until the Lord reminded him that despite how carefree and happy the life of the wicked may look, they are presently miserable and are rushing headlong into eternal misery. One purpose of this psalm we see is to firmly persuade us that all the ungodly are presently and eternally miserable and that those who keep their company will be involved in their destruction. Which means either we heed the warning embedded in verse 1 or we will learn the hard way, as they say. You see, God wants you to never deny and never forget the vast difference between sin and holiness, between the life of the godly and the life of the ungodly. Eternity alone will show how great that difference is. But until then, the godly man, says the psalmist, must take God at his word and be a man of three refusals. Another reason why this admonition is so necessary for us today is because the effects of sin are so large and widespread. One sin has the potential to ruin your marriage. One sin has the potential to destroy your reputation, to devastate your career, to ruin your life, to ruin your eternity. One sin thrust Satan out of heaven. One sin occasioned the creation of hell. One sin plunged the entire human race into condemnation. One sin necessitated the incarnation, condemnation, death, and burial of Jesus Christ. One sin. The one sin of Nadab and Abihu in worship brought fire from heaven and ended their lives. The one sin of Simeon and Levi against the Shechemites brought God's judgment on all their descendants. The one sin of Gehazi brought leprosy to all his descendants forever. And the one sin of Ananias and Sapphira against God brought immediate death. Why would we dally with even one sin? This admonition is necessary and helpful because of the danger of sin, even just one. A final reason that we need to heed this admonition is because once we've stepped foot into the way of sin, nobody knows where he's going to stop. It's a downhill slope, and the farther you go, the faster. And it's almost an insensible slide downward because Satan's craft is not to take us from A to Z by one grand leap, but through B and C and D. By degrees and by baby steps, Satan will lead us from the beginning to the end. Just think, just think of it. Satan wants nothing more than just a hearing at first. That's all he wants. Just listen to me. Just give me a minute. Just let me tell you something. Has God said? Just think about it, will you? Just a suggestion. That's it. Just a thought. That's all he asked of Eve. Just a hearing. And she gave it. And we see what happened. Through ear gate, Satan resents the sin of others as harmless. He presents the sin of others as liberating, as pleasurable, as rewarding, as inconsequential. They got away with it. It cost them nothing. They're having a great time. Nobody knew. Nobody found out. And then at last, by the wooings and example of a wicked companion, Satan entices a person into open transgression. 
And by a few steps in the way of sin, Satan desensitizes the heart and the conscience to the guilt of sin and to the pollution of sin until at last he gets a person to sit down proud of his sin. What did we used to think about this thing? Well, before we thought it was a great and a grand evil, a gross iniquity. How is it now that we've come to the place to where we think, oh, it's not so bad. It's okay. You see how necessary it is to keep our feet in the way of God's commandments by heeding the godly man's refusals. Because although grace may indeed arrest us at any stage in the process, to presume that grace will rescue you is downright foolishness. To throw yourself into the pit of sin and transgression, just presuming that at some point the Holy Spirit like Nathan is going to show up and call you out, is downright foolishness. Death is no respecter of persons, and it may intervene in our track at any point and take us out of this world. And then we are judged as we are. And left to ourselves, of course, our ruin is unavoidable. Leave ourselves in a pit, and we know exactly what the end will be. Every sin, however small, hardens the heart, numbs the conscience, and shuts out the light of saving truth. So unless we're willing to wager our eternal welfare on a sin, we should never step foot in the ways of sin. Because you don't know where you're going to stop. You don't know if you'll stop. Because let's face it, repentance is a gift. It isn't something we drum up at some point and we decide, I think I'm done with this sin thing. Let me, I'm just going to turn around. I think I'm going to repent today. This, I've had enough. That's a work of grace when we find ourselves done, when we find ourselves undone. And we turn. That's a work of grace. Repentance is not in a man. It's foolish then to step into the ways of transgression, telling ourselves, I'll repent tomorrow. I'll repent afterwards. That's grace. That's not a work. Beloved, how grateful we should be this morning for the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came with a grievance against our sin. He came to deliver us from the bondage to sin and to bring us into a relationship with himself whereby we can resist sin and turn out of the way of temptation by his grace and strength. Christ came to indwell us by his Holy Spirit so that we might have a hatred for sin, that we might have a love for God and a love for godliness. Christ came to put an end to our sin on the cross and to work his own holiness in us by his Holy Spirit as we'll learn from 1 Peter next week. Because Christ alone, Christ alone is really the man of Psalm 1. Christ alone is the man of verse 1. He alone is the one who refused the counsels and the ways and the seats of the ungodly. And it's by faith in His righteousness that we find not only saving acceptance with God, but also the enabling and the undertaking grace to walk as He walked in the refusals of ungodliness or the refusals, rather, of godliness, turning out of the way of ungodliness. Because Christ is not only the perfect pattern referenced in verse 1, but Christ is also the fountain of grace from whom we receive the godliness of verse 1. How grateful we should be for the Lord Jesus Christ, that godly man. He is the godly man in whom and from whom we have our godliness. How grateful we should be for the free offer of the gospel, by which sinners can be saved and by which we ourselves can be arrested out of the way of ungodliness and brought to the Lord, the Holy One. Let us be grateful for the church of the living God on earth. What is the church? It's that holy society of believers. It's that depository, that pillar and that buttress of heavenly truth. It's that community. The church of Christ is that community, beloved in which we are able to hear godly counsel, in which we are able to be confirmed in godly ways, and in which we are able to commune with godly companions. What a wonderful people to be amongst. What a wonderful body of which to be a part. Here we find godly company. Here we see godly ways set before us in the examples of the fathers and mothers in Israel. Here we get good counsel. Here we are provoked to love and good works. Here we are encouraged to sit with a godly posture of humility at the feet of our Savior, 
the head of the church. And let us be grateful then for the scriptures, for the word of God by which the Lord teaches us what we are to believe and what we are to do. Let us be grateful for the ministry of preaching by which the Lord keeps us from the seat of the scoffer and the way of the sinner by feeding us with godly counsel. Because that's where it begins. Giving God a hearing. Saying with Samuel, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And at your voice, at your voice, I will give heed. Walking in the ways of the Lord. Let us invite the godly counsel of his holy word that his spirit may work in us to walk in the way of the righteous and to sit in the seat of the humble and the contrite in whose hearts alone God is pleased to dwell. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, gracious and good God, how we thank you this morning, O oh Lord, for your word. And we thank you that your word is good counsel. That your word is truth. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you have never lied to anyone. You cannot deceive or lead astray. Your word has never turned anyone out of the way of righteousness. What a joy, O oh God, that you've opened our hearts and minds to receive your word as truth. And by it, O oh Lord, you sanctify your people. And we pray for more of that today. Sanctify us by your word, for your word is truth, says the Lord. Lead us, we pray, in the way of your commandments. Enlarge our hearts that we will love your ways. And grow our love, Father, for godly company. Let us turn away from the company of the ungodly and let these not be our companions and counselors. Let us not stand in the way of sinners lest we be rushed headlong with them in that way. And let us not walk according to the counsel of the ungodly. Their counsel is centered on man and not on God and their counsel seeks the ways of unrighteousness and not the ways of truth. They are but lies. We live in a world, O oh Lord, and in a day and in a time in which we are bombarded with information being touted as right and upright, as true and good. O oh God, give us discernment. May we bring every instruction, every dictum, everything touted as truth, may we bring it against the plumb line of your holy word and receive nothing as true that is not according to your truth. And may we shun all else and not fall into the trap of framing our lives according to what men say, according to what others do, and according to what is popular or easy or acceptable. But may we seek to be those in whom Christ is seen. By the counsel according to which we walk, the way in which we stand, and the company we keep. Let us not be afraid to be different, indeed strangers in this world. And let us thereby seek to be a light in this dark place in which we live. Embolden us in our witness and in our testimony. And may our lives be seen to be lived according to another rule than that which the world uses. And by that, O oh Lord, may many be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name.